Well, good morning, Guantanamo Bay. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much for being willing to be creative and join us in our attempt to build community in the midst of these times that just uh, require some creativity. And so we're excited to be able to be together, uh, even though it is in this format this morning, and we trust that uh, God's presence will be with you as families and certainly as we open the word and dive into that. But first, would you join with me in prayer? Father, I want to say thank you so much for the fact that you reign. You reign in the midst of calm and you reign in the midst of chaos. And I want to thank you that you are with us each now as we are viewing this, as, as um, we have had some opportunities maybe to take part in some worship. Lord, we just uh, thank you for your presence. We continue to ask for your presence, not just in this moments ahead, but in these days uh, that uh, can be unsettling for some. And just pray for your continued presence in the midst of it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, do you remember in elementary school when maybe your teacher would ask a question and you kind of thought maybe you knew the answer uh, and, and, and you, you, you weighed throwing it out there versus what it would be like if you were wrong and everybody would laugh and the risk reward just became too costly and you decided to let it pass and, and teacher looks around and no one's willing to give it a shot and then finally she puts the answer out there, and you think, oh, I had it. I could have been the hero. I knew the exact answer. And then maybe for the next 45 minutes, you kind of play that over and over in your head and think back what it would have been like and if she or he had asked that question and you'd have thrown out the perfect answer and, and the teacher would have lavished praise upon you and maybe thrown a ticker tape parade or well, maybe not, but maybe sometimes that's how it went down for me. But anyway, uh, that is kind of the moment that Peter – was faced with on this day. In the book of Matthew, chapter 16, uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's coming to Caesarea Philippi, and, and he just takes a moment, and he gathers his disciples, and he says, who do the people say that I am? And they begin to answer. They, one of them throws out and says, well, some say that they think you're John the Baptist, and someone else pipes in, some say Elijah. And someone else says, well, some say that you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And it's at that moment that Jesus gets that kind of quirky smile on his face that the disciples recognize as, oh, he's been setting us up. Now, we don't know that. That's not in there, but that's how I kind of guess it. And so he looks at them, and the room gets a little quiet, and he says, but who do you say that I am? And that's that moment, just like maybe for us in elementary school, where the disciples begin to look at each other and, and uh a little nervous, and all of them kind of thought maybe they knew the right answer, but no one was really willing to put it out there. And then Peter. Now, he wasn't even called Peter then. He was still just known as Simon, plain old Simon. But Simon clears his throat, looks around at the others, and decides, if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down swinging. And he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And it's quiet for a moment, and and all the disciples look to Jesus and look back to Peter and look back to Jesus, waiting to see what he's going to say. And his response comes in Matthew chapter 16, verse 17. You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means the rock. And upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you forbid on earth will be for, will forbid in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And Andrew's over in the corner going, oh man, I could have done that. I could have been that guy. Because that is like the ultimate, fantastic, best response to the right answer. And uh, you know, whereas the other disciples are kind of cringing, I'm sure Peter's looking around and going like, what? Did you guys hear that? And and there's just this great moment. He threw it out there, took a shot, perfect answer, gets all this praise from Jesus. And in the very next verse, we see that it says, From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples that he's got to go to Jerusalem, he's going to suffer, and ultimately he's going to have to die, and then he'll raise again on the third day. Now, we don't know how long it was. It just says from then on. And maybe it was hours later. Maybe it was days later. But apparently, this conversation that Jesus began to have starts to freak the disciples out. And they start to kind of, somebody's got to say something. And, of 
course, Peter, coming off of his whole, you know, one-for-one one right answer thing, he decides, don't worry, boys, I got this. I'll step in. And, and so he walks over to Jesus and puts an arm around his shoulder and pulls him off to the side and says, Jesus, this just isn't going to do. You know, I, I, I don't know where all this crazy talk is coming from, but I want to let you know that uh, you, you remember that whole, you know, uh, I am the rock and build the church and whatever I forbid in heaven will be forbid on earth. Well, heaven forbid that you will go and suffer and die. And I'm saying right now, it's not happening. And uh, I, I got to mo- imagine for a moment he might have been feeling pretty good about himself. But Jesus' response comes in verse 23. It says, Jesus turned to Peter and he said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And poor Peter goes from here to just crushed and just gets put in his place. And man, that must have been such a difficult thing for him at that moment. I know it would be for me. Verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. And the significance of that moment cannot be overlooked. And the idea is that things are not always going to be rosy. Things are not always going to turn out like we thought. I imagine Peter saw that situation as he's on this roll, and he goes from this great right answer to this terrible wrong answer, and, uh, and just kind of that chaos that comes from that. And, and in life, the same thing. Things just tend to not always work out the way that we think they should. We go from highs to lows. We go from thinking everything's smooth sailing to suddenly it's not. Sometimes uh, we might make a wrong decision that, that can challenge us. Sometimes, you know, we'll just, in fact, life will just get squirrely on us and things will just start to get a little unsettling. And at, at this moment, Jesus challenges them And for that matter, he really challenges us in a time that, frankly, is kind of squirrely right now. That is your faith going to be an only if kind of faith? Or is your faith an even though faith? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. You know, um, are we only secure in in our faith when things are working out the way that we think they should? um, When they work out the way that we expected or the way that we hoped? Uh, is it that kind of faith? And only if this happens and this happens, well, then I will know he's God. Only if I pray for this and God comes through, then I will know he's God. Only if uh, my family and everything back home is settled the way that I want it to be, will I have faith in God? Or will our faith remain an even though faith? Even though things get squirrely, even though things get out of control, I will continue to have faith. And this is kind of a big girl, big boy moment in our faith. This is what Jesus set the disciples up wanting them to know. Wren Collective is one of my uh, favorite groups that I love to listen to. And uh, they recently released an album called The Good News. And every song on this album is just a different aspect of why we call the gospel message, the message of Jesus, the good news. And it's a different part about the way we, we should live life, how we should respond to all of this. And One of the songs is called Life is Beautiful. And it might not be everyone's preferred style of music, but I'm going to ask you to just take a minute. It's like three minutes long, and I understand the background is a little irritating, so bear with that. Um, But to take a listen to this video, and then just want to talk about it for a minute. So in that song, uh, you might have picked up on the first stanza. There's these lines. It says, you see my sin, but you love me the same. You breathe on my hurt, but you raise me again. Up from the ash, up from the dust, you're recreating us. I will not waste this day that you've made. I will be glad. And then that tagline says, rejoice, rejoice in the sunshine and in the sorrow. Oh, my soul will rejoice. And that is the challenge. That's the big challenge of this song. That's the big challenge of us in the midst of of times of calm and times of crisis is will we rejoice in the sunshine and will we rejoice in the sorrow? Look, we were created by God with strong feelings. We are people of feeling. 
And feelings are great because they motivate us. On, on, uh, they motivate us to run to things. They motivate us to run away from things. They give us the courage to make big leaps of, of faith and big leaps of courage in our life. But sometimes we rely on those feelings a little too much. Sometimes our reality only is based on what we currently feel, and that is always a problem. The challenge of this song, the challenge of so much of Scripture, uh, uh, really a reoccurring theme throughout the entire Bible, is that we need to hold on to hope and truth even when we don't necessarily feel like it. And it's really not a new concept. Right towards the end of the Old Testament, you know, the last set of books in the Old Testament are called the Minor Prophets. And these are just basically lesser-known prophets that, that God had spoken to and, and had made prophecy and, and all these books. And about the fifth to last book is a book called Habakkuk. And Habakkuk, some people pronounce it Habakkuk, but it's Habakkuk to me. So uh, Habakkuk was a prophet, and he and the Lord had this very, very tight relationship. The book of Habakkuk is only three chapters long, but as you read through that book, you see that they, Habakkuk speaks to the Lord almost as if he's just sitting across the table speaking to a friend. And, and sometimes he shares his frustration, sometimes he shares his joy. All these things are, are a part of, of that little book. And, and uh, in this book, we see this incredible swing from chapter 1 to chapter 3. And, and that, you know, the fact is that it speaks to exactly what we're talking about. In these three chapters, uh, Habakkuk goes from lamenting the fact that the Lord just seems to not be present, that all this chaos is happening and God is just not there. And, and, and chapter 1, verse 2, Habakkuk says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? He says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. And friends, this is a weird, scary time in our life. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations, even this past week. People have been in the Navy for you know, 20, 25 years, been in the Army for all these years. and thought, oh, this, I've never seen anything like this. Obviously, uh, we think about things that are going on here, going on back home, and it's just an odd time. And Some of us are, are rightfully concerned about what is going to happen. Um, some are less concerned about what's going to happen here, more concerned about what's happening at home. Um, some have had plans completely changed, and that's unsettling. Um, many of us are uncertain about where this thing is going, and we might feel a bit like Habakkuk in that first chapter, like, where, oh Lord, are you? I'm praying over here, I'm seeking you, but I don't see like things are getting any better. But this is one of those moments to let our faith grow from a only if to an even though kind of faith. In that book of Habakkuk, as I've talked about the first uh, chapter, uh, he starts with that. But as Habakkuk works through, listen to these words from the final few verses of chapter 3, the end of the book. The same person that said, Oh, Lord, how long must I call for help, but you don't listen? Violence is everywhere, but you don't come to save. Now, these are his words. In verse 17 of chapter 3, Even though the fig trees have no blossoms, and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. And I love it. And for you who uh, tend to be musical folks, I love the fact, I think Habakkuk was a bit of a rock star because uh, he was definitely a worship guy. The end of that book says, oh, you know, those words that you just read, you should really, says for the choir director, this prayer should be accompanied by stringed instruments. So basically saying, when you say that, you should be singing that as a song. Even though I'm not sure what's going to happen here. Even though this is a really, really lousy time to be separated from my family. Even though I can't know for sure what next month or next week will look like, I will be a person of hope and joy. We've got to ask ourselves, is, are those just words? Just because somebody says that in the Old Testament, is that just automatically supposed to happen? So it's a valid thing to say, say how is that possible? How could I possibly have that kind of faith? Now, um, it's not because of how we feel, that I can assure you, but it's rather because of our knowledge of biblical truth. There's a couple lines from that song that you listen to that are really direct reflections of Scripture. 
this happy-go-lucky song that maybe you got irritated with because it is so happy-go-lucky, uh, Life is Beautiful, is backed up with some real scriptural truth. And the first is this. They say that line in that song, Life is beautiful because the Lord sees our sin and he loves us just the same. And that's a truth from a lot of places in scripture. One of those, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. See, we play this game in our mind where we think, again, if I could hide my sins from the Lord, then maybe he'll be uh, okay with me. Or even though we know, we say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to admit him. He's not going to say anything. We're going to go along like all is okay. But that's just not the fact. Romans 5, 8 reminds us that God knows all about our stuff. Nothing is hidden from him. But it is even in the midst of that sinfulness that he chose to die for us. And that in itself certainly makes life beautiful. But the song goes on to say, life is beautiful because the Lord breathes on our hurts and he rises, raises us up again. And, and really what that's talking about is that even though we might hurt ourselves through our own shortcomings, through our own sin, or, or maybe because just something that comes from the outside and just damages our heart, even with all of that, he's like a loving parent who kind of blows on our scrape, gives us a little pat on the bottom and and, and tells us to get back in the game. Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 31. There's a passage that deals a bit with this. And this is just after, um, well, let me just read it. It says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But what I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, go and strengthen your brothers. And Jesus is, is, he is, he knows what is coming. Uh, Peter again has declared when, when it's getting close to the time that Jesus is going to be arrested. And he basically has told Jesus, look, all these other guys, they're gonna, they might churn on you, they might abandon you, but not this guy. And Jesus put his arm around him. He's like, Simon, you are. You're going to blow it big time. And afterwards, you're going to get yourself up off the ground. You're going to know that I forgive you and love you. And that I want you to be the one that helps picks up your brothers. And there is this, this incredible moment in Scripture where God says, like, like, I know your shortcomings. I know when you're going to get hurt and you're going to hurt yourself. I'm going to help you get up, dust you off, and get back in the game. And that is a great moment, a great truth of hope. And Peter put that into practice so many times. And I love that they didn't try to hide that out of Scripture. God's like, print that stuff. That is good stuff because we need to be reminded of that when we come up short. The challenges uh, of these biblical truths is that even when life looks the most chaotic, we can rejoice and have joy. And that's not an empty joy or a fake joy that isn't allowed to be honest. We can be honest about our fears and our hurts and our anger and our, our concern and all those things. But uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a joy that admits our fears and our failures and evaluates it against the truth of Scripture and is able to stand tall and say, even though things aren't working out as I would have them, I will rejoice. Even though things aren't, aren't uh, going the way that I had planned, I will have joy in my heart. I will have hope. That passage again. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crops fail and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. That was true 4,000 years ago when it was first written. That was true 2,000 years ago when the disciples walked with Jesus. And that is true today. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for, as always, just letting the disciples live like real people in front of our eyes to remind us that it's not about being perfect. It's about pursuing you at all costs. And Lord, thank you for the reminder that even when we don't have it all together, even when we are concerned and scared and, and uh, rattled by unsettling times, that you give us a reason to rejoice and to have joy because the end game is settled, because you are not fretting and wringing your hands, because you are the God who is in control. We trust in you. We place our hope in you. Lord, all the things that swirl around us, we stand steady, not because we are that good, but because we choose to stand in your presence. 
And it's in the name of Jesus we pray together. Amen. Well, friends, continue to look to the Gitmo 1100 Church page. Uh, there'll be more information, daily devotions coming Monday through Friday this week. Uh, lots of information about how we're going to go about this next week. But one thing I want to point out to you is we are going to take communion together next Sunday. And uh, we have these cups that I, to be honest, I didn't love them when I first saw them, but they're the self-contained cups that have the little aluminum foil that has the little wafer in there. Those things were made for this time. So what we're going to be asking, uh, we're going to be posting it on our page. Anybody that wants to take communion together next Sunday at 1100, we're going to do a, a Facebook Live moment where we're going to take communion together. We're going to be delivering those communion cups door to door uh, on Saturday. So if you would like to take communion, be looking for a way to respond to that, and we'll all take communion together next week. Other than that, God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Stay confident and put your hope in the Lord. Amen.